Okay, hello again. My name is Joe McDougall, a professor in residence here at the University of Connecticut School of Law and the Executive Director for the Center for Energy and Environmental Law. Thank you for coming to this breakout session. I'll be moderating this panel in partnership with Luann Cooley. Luann is a recent graduate of the Yukon Law School and is now a legal fellow at Circa, studying legal issues with, uh, regarding climate resilience. Uh, she comes to this project with a lot of experience as a former educator at Yukon Stores, as well as a public official serving currently uh, on the Planning and Zoning Commission Inland Wetlands Agency for Mansfield. Before I get to our panel, I wanted to ask you all for a little help. Uh, Luann is, and I are researching legal issues and that are impediments or help with resilience. So we have a special ask of you for this session, for this audience. If any of you have thoughts on how the law is either hindering or helping resilience, things that you think are in your way or changes that you think would matter, um, it's extremely important for us to get feedback from audiences like this. We don't get the opportunity that often. So if you'd kindly put those thoughts along with your questions for the speakers just into the question forum, um, we would really appreciate it. Past SEAL Circa projects like this have generated white papers for towns and even assisted in legislation that helped redefine sea level rise in the state. So if at any point in time in this breakout section or even afterward, if you have thoughts on this matter, we would really appreciate it. But now onto our panel. I couldn't be more excited to welcome our two speakers. Each is at the very center of some of the most vexing problems of resilience, land use, equity, and also how to finance. How do we form the, the constancy to actually be able to engage in true resilient policies? Uh, Re Dr. Rebecca French will be our second speaker. She'll be discussing the Governor's Council on Climate Change, particularly the subcommittee that has one of the hardest jobs, I think, uh, making recommendations on how we can finance resilience. And I'll speak a little bit more about Rebecca just prior to her talk. However, our first speaker is probably well known to many of you, Professor Sarah Bronin. She's Professor of Law and Faculty Director for the Center for Energy and Environmental Law. Sarah's professional life is a blur of activity. She is both an attorney and an architect. Uh, she was educated at the Yale Law School as a Truman Scholar and at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar and the University of Texas at Austin. At our law school, she's the driving force for, for you know, all environmental and energy activities on campus uh, through, uh, through our, can our, it sounds a little strange to say on campus in COVID times. She helps guide SEAL in our courses from clinics to courses and sessions like this. She writes extensively, including treaties on land use, historic preservation, and recently on what the pandemic can teach climate attorneys. Uh, next semester, she'll be a visiting professor at the Yale Law School and the University of Pennsylvania, and was last year a visiting professor at Paris's Sorbonne. Um, in recent months, she has been analyzing the land use patterns in Connecticut, both for issues of resilience and for questions about structural segregation and inequity. This led her to the founding of Desegregate CT, which has quickly established a large following in our state. You can read Sarah's and op-eds in newspapers throughout the country. So at this time, I'd like to invite my colleague, Professor Sarah Bronin, to activate her camera and to come onto the stage. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Joe. And I think that anybody who knows uh, anything about SEAL knows that uh, you are the driving force behind SEAL, but very uh, nice introduction. Um, thank everybody for uh, coming today. And you know, some of you have heard a little bit about Desegregate Connecticut before, but uh, today I just wanted to go through and um, some a few uh, things relevant to this conference. Um, first question that I think we'll consider is, is land use really a resiliency issue? Um, second, I wanna talk about uh, what we're hoping to achieve with the legislature this year um, to try to address these uh, the issues that we'll be starting with. Um, I also wanted to talk about the data uh, and research that we've collected. And then finally just say, you know what, what can you do? All right, so what is the problem? Um, or the issue. So, so it's my contention um, that zoning, uh, which is the regulation of structures, land use, and lots, is a fundamental uh, environmental concern and raises fundamental resiliency questions. Many of you have seen this map from Yukon Clear uh, showing the extent to which ground uh, cover has increased and imp impervious ground cover has increased and developable land has increased. Um, I won't get uh, go into this in great detail, but I would encourage you to check out their changing landscape report, which shows the extent to which we have sprawled outward, uh, taking up green space and, uh, and uh, hurting our environment. 
So the consequences of bad land use policies, there's huge environmental consequences. Uh, so just from a physical standpoint, we're building further outward, we're sprawling into green fields. Um, that means that we are driving more, that means we are using more, um, we're emitting more, we're emitting greenhouse gases. Um, it means that uh, we uh, pollute our air as a result, uh, we make ourselves less healthy. Um, and we pollute our water because the more we pave, uh, the more uh, the runoff goes into our rivers and streams. So land use policy affects resiliency in these very basic ways. Um, we do have a, 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 on our website, uh, if you didn't catch it in the first slide, it's desegregatect.org and you can follow us on Twitter at desegregatect. Um, but uh, we do have a, an explanation with some citations to um, to this uh, problem in our background section. Oops, sorry about that. Um, you know, one of the things we also see is that we're not zoning in the right ways around the right places. Uh, the Regional Plan Association has done a study of zoning uh, in the tri-state area, so New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut, and has found that around rail stations where we should be zoning for dense development, we typically zone for uh, large lot, single family housing. And what does that do? That means that we're, we're essentially robbing ourselves of the opportunity to take advantage of transit oriented development. It's the term that has been bandied around for you know, a long time, but it really is true that the closer and more compact uh, dense development that you get near train stations, uh, the better it is for the environment and for equity. Um, if you, uh, you know, just skipping ahead to what, what we're proposing, we're not proposing that there be skyscrapers in Guilford. Um, we are, however, looking at a way for uh, the towns with rail stations to uh, become a little bit more uh, dense than they are and to relax some of the very restrictive zoning around, uh, around transit. Social impacts of bad land use laws. Uh, so we've seen this and uh, social and, and economic segregation, racial and economic segregation. Um, if you don't uh, believe that, uh, there's a whole section on our website that talks about uh, segregation is real. And we just have to accept that, that we are, um, we are, uh, we have metro areas that are the most segregated in the country, three of the top 10 on income and Fairfield County is, is number one, uh, unfortunately in uh, segregation on an income basis. Um, it means that people can't get access to jobs. It means they can't get access to opportunities. Um, and it means more food and uh, physical insecurity, which leads to a lack of household resiliency. So I know today is about environmental resiliency, but I'll just flag that, of course, uh, environmental resiliency and household resiliency go hand in hand. We are trying to grapple with this. You may have seen this article in the Wall Street Journal picturing Westport, which is 1% black um, and uh, is uh, apparently having local conversations about how to change uh, its zoning regulations. We're also looking at the state level. And that's what brings me to um, desegregate Connecticut. So at our core, we are a coalition of neighbors and nonprofit institutions and we accept again that our law, land use laws have had segregative effects and we do think that change at the state level is probably needed. Our coalition continues to expand. Um, oh, I didn't put this one up here. The US uh, Green Building Council Connecticut chapter just joined us among other environmental groups that have, uh, that have joined our efforts. But there are the plan planners, landscape architects, um, uh, social justice organizations like the Urban League, even the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities has joined our coalition. Now, all of these entities are work meeting and working to try to develop um, a, a, plat a platform for us to all go together to the legislature to say, this is what we agree more or less uh, on in terms of the path forward, because all of these groups know that we have a problem and uh, know that it's time to fix it. So our overall goal is to change land use to make it more inclusive by design. And within that, we've divided uh, up our message really into three parts. Many of us, including myself, are motivated by equity and that issue of, of household resiliency. Um, but of course, there are those who are uh, motivated uh, for zoning reform on economic and environmental grounds. Again, we have a page on our website talking about this and this is what it looks like. So if you're interested in the, the three justifications that we are most highlighting, uh, feel free to check that out. 
All right, so moving on to our legislative agenda, we think that statewide reform should address three issues. Uh, housing diversity, oops, sorry, my mouse is out of control. Uh, housing diversity, which is uh, really means uh, creating something other than, than, than what we have created in the past, which is predominantly single family homes on large lots. That's not to say we don't want to abolish single family zoning. Uh, that's been stated about uh, our movement. But what we want to do is to, within the existing character of communities, architectural character, and I'll get to that in a moment, um, we want to create uh, more housing within, again, the framework that, that, that people already expect in their communities. Um, housing supply, we're not producing housing fast enough, period. We don't have uh, enough housing across the board. That has led to both problems of affordability um, and also uh, just the, the sheer fact that people who want to move to Connecticut don't have places to that they can move to. Um, you know, we've seen an exodus from New York City uh, in recent months due to COVID. That, uh, I'm not sure, you know, whether that will last, uh, but, but there's lots of people, millennials uh, in particular, who might have wanted to move from New York City and just can't find the housing that, that they would want to live in, because not every uh, young person or young person with a family wants to live in a large lot out in the middle of, of nowhere. Um, lots of them want to live closer to uh, action, and that is a changing um, issue and it's something that is, uh, we should really reckon with here. Um, finally, improving the process. Lots of decisions that are made at the local level are emotion and not fact driven. And we really need to get past that um, and, and move toward a more standardized uh, system of permitting projects, housing projects in particular. There's something up on our website that explains these ideas a little bit more. I'll touch on a couple though that we, um, that we have uh, uh, started looking at. Uh, in, in much in greater detail and will be on our legislative agenda in January. One is accessory dwelling units. And this is an example of how you can create more housing units within existing housing stock. From an environmental perspective, this is great uh, because it means that you're not building more or, or outward, you're actually taking what you have and making it slightly, modestly more dense by allowing a small unit uh, that can be created within an existing house. Um, there's also this idea of middle housing where two to four units and at the bottom you see a little bit larger uh, configurations, um, but, but really two to four unit housing that can be placed more compactly on a lot and that can be designed to look like uh, a single family house, perhaps with, with different entrances um, on the front and the side, for example. So we think that middle housing is a good scale for Connecticut. Again, not every town has to have skyscrapers like, like Hartford does. And then finally, uh, or I think there's a couple more. Another uh, issue is transit-oriented development, um, which I mentioned before. Uh, Brookings has just done a study about how Massachusetts needs to unlock uh, its, uh, which has a huge, by the way, Massachusetts has a, a, it's a very similar housing affordability crisis to uh, Connecticut. Um, and we, and uh, Brookings has said, you know, Massachusetts really has to look specifically at zoning around transit to unlock um, housing creation and to help uh, alleviate the, the housing burdens. Um, there's also an issue that we're talking about, uh, which is parking mandates. So towns all across the state mandate that housing uh, be uh, have a specific number of parking spaces. And we think that some of those requirements are excessive. And so they impose excessive costs on housing. And again, this too is an environmental issue because the more parking uh, that is provided in any given development, the more driving happens. There is a causation or correlation effect between the existence of parking and the amount of driving. This has been studied by researchers across many institutions. So from an environmental standpoint, helping us make the shift from a car dominant society to one where there are alternatives um, is something that we should really uh, think about. And I think this is my last prime example, um, the form-based code. Uh, so we think that uh, ensuring that the legislature uh, 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 decides that uh, OPM or some similar agency develop a statewide form-based code that local governments can choose to draw from um, will help us to develop in uh, ways that will enable uh, 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 as of right permitting for housing as opposed to uh, the special permit public hearing process where you're not looking necessarily at the architecture, but you're looking at other things. 
things like character of the people who are living uh, or potentially moving into a new housing uh, jurisdiction. So this falls into that equity side of the conversation, but we've seen all too often in Connecticut that uh, housing uh, projects are stalled because people object to the people who will be living there. Uh, we have uh, an FAQs page that I'll flag at the end that, uh, that talks about that, that issue. Um, we also think we should train land use commissioners. Um, that, that's something that's been floating around for a while, and it's time to finally pull the trigger on that. Land use commissioners have uh, huge impacts on, on our economy, and they should be uh, trained to some, uh, some standard on an annual basis. There's some other environmental issues that we've been uh, looking at. Uh, one is 22A19 interventions. One is 830G, expanding that to water, to sewer and traffic authorities. Um, looking also at technical standards for sewers uh, and uh, community, uh, community sewerage and all of that. Um, and then I put large lot zoning on here. We have not, I don't think we will propose that this year. I don't think we will try to tackle that, but that actually really is probably um, a primary driver of, uh, of the sprawl that we see. Uh, we're gonna try to work within existing zoning. Um, all right, so data and research. Um, so we've done, you can see this all on our website, we've done uh, a dive into every zoning code in the state to pick out a few key characteristics of one per town. Um, so uh, for example, minimum lot size, minimum parking requirements. Um, we are now doing something, let's see if I have a, I don't have an image of it. Uh, we are we are we have accessory dwelling unit data. We have uh, a, a website up on what other states have done because lots of people say, "Well, this can never be done." Well, guess what? Lots of other states have done it, um, and so we can do that too. Um, but the project that I'm most excited about um, that we have 20 researchers working on is a project which will map um, all of the zoning codes in the state, which are 2,422. We think um, that's kind of what we've counted so far. Some of them are not. Some of them are named districts, but not mapped, but whatever. Um, we're mapping those across 52 different housing uh, characteristics. Um, and we are hopefully gonna be able to work with the Connecticut Data Collaborative to get that uh, interactive map available to the public. Here's what we've done on other states reforms. There's lots of information on our website. Uh, there's also zoning laws in plain English. Okay, so last uh, minute, I believe, I'm just looking at my clock, uh, what can you do? Um, so just to recognize, I mean, the first thing is to recognize that housing is a, an environmental issue. It is a resiliency issue, and it has become more so during COVID. Um, you know, get involved and stay aware of legislative developments. Um, this was us from the summer trying to push legislators to, to tackle this issue. We rushed together a set of proposals. We are now refining those. Um, and then there's a whole take action page on our website. We would encourage you to contact your legislators and indicate that this is an environmental issue um, to sign on, to sign your organization on. We're still looking for, uh, for environmental organizations as part of our coalition. Uh, we've got the Trust for Public Land. We, you know, we've got a few in there, um, but we'd, we'd really like to see a unified front on this front. Um, and then check out our FAQs. So thank you. And again, um, uh, you know, th this is where you can find us. Thank you. Turn it back over to Joe. Thank you, Sarah. There, there's so much there. The um, I, the transit-oriented development uh, charts you had on existing land pa patterns is so relevant to a lot of the work that that we we, we do at Circa. Um, as a former land use commissioner myself, I, I can't help but endorse the idea of uh, or of our land, you know, land use official um, the idea of regular training for for political volunteers and elected officials. A lot to talk about. So that was great. Um, I'd like to now turn to our second speaker, Dr. Rebecca French. Uh, Dr. French was one of the inaugural members of Circa, helping to craft Circa's outreach and mission. Uh, she oversaw the process where Connecticut applied for the National Disaster Relief Competition Grant, successfully bringing, and this number is astonishing, $64.3 million into the state for resilience projects. Um, in her many firsts, she is now the first director of the new Office of Climate Planning at the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, where she advises the DEEP on mitigation, adaptation, and resilience plans across all divisions of the agency. Uh, she's extremely involved, as you'll hear, in the Governor's Council on Climate Change and the Financing Resilience Subcommittee, uh, the, part of the focus of her talk today. Dr. French holds a PhD from Virginia Tech a master's in soil science from Cornell and an undergraduate degree in chemistry from Oberlin. Uh, Rebecca, if you kindly turn on your camera and your mic and enter the conference. And 
there you go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. I'll pull up my presentation. All right, uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, as Joe said, I am the director of the Office of Climate Planning for the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. And uh, I'll be talking about the Governor's Council on Climate Change today. Uh, so the, this is a quick background on what is the Governor's Council on Climate Change. Uh, it was launched in September 2019 when Governor Lamont uh, rejuvenated the council uh, through Executive Order 3, uh, and he expanded its scope to include both mitigation of carbon emissions and uh, for the first time to address the impacts of climate change on our state through adaptation and resilience. The a governor's Council on Climate Change existed under the previous Malloy administration, but was uh, for the most part focused uh, entirely on reducing emissions in Connecticut and strategies to achieve that. So again, Executive Order 3 had two objectives, monitor and report on the state's implementation of the greenhouse gas emissions reduction strategies that were developed under the uh, the previous Governor's Council on Climate Change, and then uh, brand new to develop and implement adaptation strategies to assess and prepare for the impacts of climate change. And, uh, you know, I appreciate, greatly appreciate all the work that UConn Circa has done to uh, provide us with the best available science, actionable science at the local scale that uh, is directly informing of this effort. And you heard John Trasinski talking about those different impacts this morning. In addition to uh, these two objectives, the executive order also took an overarching uh, view of incorporating equity into all of the recommendations. And I pulled sort of the two uh, phrases where this is included in the executive order under mitigation, the governor charged the council with prioritizing, integrating and advancing equitable distribution of the costs and benefits of climate change mitigation planning and policies, specifically addressing disproportionate impacts of such strategies on environmental justice communities. And then under adaptation, we were charged with recommending strategies to prioritize climate change adaptation efforts to protect vulnerable communities that may be disproportionately impacted by the effects of climate change. Now, vulnerable communities, environmental justice communities, those are overlapping terms, but vulnerable communities uh, is a much more expansive uh, definition. Uh, and we have uh, an, an equity and environmental justice working group that uh, expanded on what, you know, how do we define vulnerable communities in Connecticut? They are most certainly defined by what is uh, largely how we define environmental justice communities in Connecticut by low and moderate income communities, but uh, vulnerable communities can include those population groups like those um, uh, disabled populations, uh, in, you know, communities of, uh, addressing sort of issues of mental health, children, uh, pregnant women. Uh, so there's a lot to work through there. The structure of the council. Uh, so the Governor's Council on Climate Change has 23 members. Uh, about uh, half of those are commissioners from uh, multiple agencies. We also have representatives from the business sector. We have uh, environmental organizations. We have uh, community foundation representation. We also have representatives from a municipality and a council of government. So it's a, it's a highly diverse uh, council that is not, you know, that is not entirely dominated by state agencies. We have a lot of voices from outside state government participating in this process. Those 23 members are split into uh, the two objectives, a climate change mitigation subcommittee and a climate change adaptation and resiliency subcommittee. But most of the work has been taking place in the working group process. We formed seven working groups, uh, one 
focused entirely on mitigation issues. And then we had three groups that crossed between the two areas. So I talked about the charge to equity and environmental justice, assisting uh, the council with addressing the equity lens issue, um, working in natural lands, which uh, address both ways that we can sequester and store carbon, as well as ways we can use nature to adapt to the impacts of climate change, science and technology, which included, again, a, a lot of the great work from Circa and Yukon on the impacts of climate change and research questions we need to address to better inform decision making. And then under adaptation and resiliency, we had uh, four groups uh, financing adaptation and resilience, which I'm going to talk more about, the infrastructure and land use adaptation group, public health and safety issues, and assessing vulnerabilities in state assets in and operations. So uh, this process is actually a two-year process. We're in phase one, where we're, we have a first report due to the governor in January 2021. As I said, that working group process has been where we've been spending the majority of our time to date. The working groups have uh, completed uh, draft reports that went out for a 30-day public review period, and they finalized the reports. They are available on our website as of this week. Uh, I just want to congratulate the working groups on a huge amount of effort that was all, you know, shifted online uh, when we went under the stay safe, stay home executive order. And uh, just an incredible feat of, of people dedicating their time to this, to this issue, given uh, given the circumstances, but also had the interesting effect that we had a huge amount of participation because the the barriers to you know showing up to an in person meeting, uh, you know now you can you could attend all these working group meetings from your home, and so uh, did actually I think increase our overall uh, participation, but also limited us in some ways that we weren't able to do some of the in person engagement that we wanted to do, particularly in uh, in environmental justice communities. So we're going to continue that process and I hope we'll be able to do some of that type of engagement in 2021, here's, here's hoping. Uh, but right now we're in the deliberation process for the GC3 members themselves, reviewing those working group reports and preparing recommendations that will be adopted by the council to go forward to the governor for his consideration. And again, I've kind of already covered this, uh, phase one, uh, mid-January, we'll have that report and then we'll continue the process in phase two, where uh, these are really an initial list of recommendations and we'll continue a robust engagement process and, uh, and focus on uh, how to integrate these processes into agency, uh, these recommendations into agency processes in year two. So uh, going forward, I just want again to give a summary of, uh, of what this process has looked like. Because we had seven working groups we had an immense amount of participation. We had at least 162 individual working group members at, at one point in time. I think that number has climbed since we made this slide. We had, uh, again, this was as of July, we had 100, had taken, done 120 meetings. Um, we had 100 contributing organizations through that process. And uh, at the end of the day, we're, we're achieving a zero carbon target for electricity the electricity sector by 2040. We're making progress towards our 45% reduction in CO2 levels by 2030. And we're coming up with a statewide adaptation and resilience plan for the state of Connecticut. So uh, yeah, just quick introduction to all the different working groups here. So starting off with equity, environmental justice and uh, was charged with ensuring communities are most vulnerable to and disproportionately impacted by climate change will have the opportunity to meaningfully participate in the development of adaptation strategies that meet their needs and achieve equitable solutions and review and make new recommendations. Uh, progress on mitigation strategies was working towards that 45% reduction by 2030 and looking at the transportation sector, uh, changes we need to make in our electricity sector as well as our building sector. And we also looked at uh, recommendations across these sector sectors and non-energy issues. Uh, working in natural lands made recommendations for implementing the role of nature-based solutions like scaling up the preservation and restoration of forests and coastal wetlands, rivers, green and natural infrastructure, agricultural lands in climate change mitigation and adaptation. 
Uh, they, they split themselves into four subgroups on forest rivers, wetlands, and agriculture. So uh, if you go to our site for the reports, you'll see uh, four subgroup reports under the Working in Natural Lands Working Group. Science and technology was charged with providing scientific and technical support to the Climate Change Adaptation and Resiliency Subcommittee and assisting with translating climate modeling and data into actionable downscaled information that can be used to incorporate into adaptation and resiliency planning processes. Again, the kinds of things that Resilient Connecticut is doing at CERCA, we're translating and doing, taking that same approach at the state, uh, statewide scale. Infrastructure and land use uh, was charged with recommendations for adapting our state's infrastructure in the areas of transportation, utilities, and buildings, and integrating climate change into land use planning and policies. Uh, public health and safety, uh, again, charged with addressing the health and safety impacts of climate change, which are numerous, and they come in the areas of air quality, vector-borne diseases, extreme events, waterborne illnesses, nutrition, food security, and food safety, and mental health and well-being. And uh, finally, we had the Finance and Funding Adaptation and Resilience Working Group, uh, sometimes known as the How Do We Pay For It Working Group. And we were charged with identifying innovative and practical options to finance and fund climate adaptation and, uh, and resilience mechanisms to advance, uh, to scale investment in the broad spectrum of climate resilience strategies and solutions. So I'm gonna go into a little more detail about what that working group did. I was one of the co-chairs of that working group who was also chaired by Brian Garcia, the Connecticut Green Bank, Commissioner Andrew Mays of the Connecticut Insurance Department, uh, as well as uh, Deputy Commissioner Alexandra Dom from DECD. And we were joined by many other uh, representatives who all had contributed significantly, um, including uh, Joe McDougall, uh, who joined us and, and advised that group. The, the financing group decided that one area, in addition to making recommendations on how to pay for it, we also thought it was important to highlight how climate change is impacting the financial sector. This was not a topic that was really covered in any of the other working groups, but it was increasingly in the news and in the consciousness. And I, uh, I've heard whisperings that it's made it into the, the consciousness of the Biden transition team too, as they're thinking about actions to take on climate change. It is critical that we are transparent about how climate change is going to impact the financial sector. It threatens everything from the 30 year mortgage because we know that the world is gonna look different in 30 years. So by the time you're at the end of that mortgage, you're not, uh, your, your home is not in the same climate it is uh, at the beginning of that mortgage. Um, and we're concerned about how it could impact city bonding authority and, uh, and market related risk in general. There, we also looked at some other uh, barriers and issues that we need to understand about uh, financing and funding. Uh, disaster recovery has been the major source of resilience funding. That National Disaster Resilience Competition that Joe mentioned in my introduction actually was a disaster recovery program through the Department of Housing and Urban Development with funding allocated after Superstorm Sandy. And, uh, but there have been studies that have shown that disaster recovery funding actually increases the racial wealth gap of whites and people of color. Uh, they found that FEMA disaster recovery aid in 20 U.S. counties increased inequality of wealth, finding that whites accumulate more wealth after natural disasters while residents of color accumulate less. So even in our efforts to recover from a natural disaster and become more resilient, we can, we can have a, a negative impact on equity. So we really need to delve into this and and make sure this is not happening in Connecticut as we go forward. As I said, Commissioner Mays is one of the co-chairs of this group. Um, insurance was one of our focus areas and something we want to continue to think through and, and delve into in 2021. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that Connecticut has $754 billion with a B in insured assets at risk from storms in our coastal areas. That's um, both flood risk and uh, wind damage. And uh, we're also known in Connecticut as the insurance capital of the world. But this is an area that, uh, you know, in Connecticut, we could take the lead on the climate crisis in the insurance industry. All right, so this is the how do we pay for it section. So we had many recommendations um, under uh, 
five different strategy areas. I'm just going to highlight the strategies and uh, for now and give you a flavor of, of what's in there. But I, I recommend uh, taking a look at the report and, and uh, paying attention to what the Governor's Council on Climate Change is doing going forward and what gets adopted to put forward to the governor. Um, strategy one, uh, build the governance structure to allow for effective and efficient financing and funding. So we know that uh, you know you don't just need dollars, you need to be able to implement them. You need a governor, government that can lead and facilitate the development of projects at the state, regional, and municipal scale. We need a project pipeline. We need a way to uh, accept and effectively use federal funds, uh, which we hope, which are available, currently available, we hope will, will grow as the impacts of climate change are more and more recognized by the federal government. So, you know, recommendations under this include everything from a, a task force to focus on what, you know, what do we need to do to set Connecticut up for success, uh, looking at how we prioritize the investment of, of dollars, particularly in our vulnerable communities. And, uh, and then, you know, looking at everything from, you know, how do we use the dollars that we have effectively? Are we, uh, when we make investments, are we doing so in a resilient way in our infrastructure? Under uh, strategy two, uh, we need to generate revenue sources to pay for resilience projects and program. So uh, we've had great success um, in Connecticut and become a national model through the Green Bank on how to use the energy efficiency savings to pay for projects. The, the kind of savings you get from resilience is a little different. It comes from avoided losses. And uh, so you don't sort of see an avoided loss on your bill. You only see that negative balance when you get hit by a storm or you get flooded. Um, or with sea level rise, your roads increasingly break down faster because they're being flooded more frequently, for example. So how do we uh, internalize that externality in our, our system is kind of a challenge. So we need to establish um, other revenue sources for funds that will save the state and municipalities dollars and avoided loss. So that would include things like uh, resilience, establishing resilience fees, um, different um, using, you know, tax incremental financing districts, uh, user fees, there's a multitude of ways that you could establish those kinds of programs. A uh, third strategy is supplied grants and loans to fund resilience projects and program. Uh, we need to establish a program to do this. We, we don't uh, currently have one. Um, and, uh, you know, these programs were largely supported by state bond financing backed by taxpayer dollars, but you could also uh, back grants and loans by a revenue generating mechanism. So if you can establish a revenue generating mechanism, you have a way to, you know, pay back a loan uh, for, a, for a resilience project. And we don't currently have a mechanism to do that in Connecticut, or at least we have some ways maybe, but it's, it's not well established or used. Strategy four, um, we can investigate the use of tax credit programs to invest in community resilience. We have some existing tax credit programs that have been used um, in, especially the low-income housing tax credit to great success in um, putting forward affordable housing. Obviously we need to do more as you heard from, from Sarah Bronin, uh, but tax credits are potentially a ripe area, but, uh, but more to do there, more to look into. And uh, strategy five, uh, engage the foundation and philanthropic community as a funding and financing partner. So we have a, a strong foundation and philanthropic community in Connecticut as a network of community partners. It's uniquely positioned to take an important role in meeting both climate change goals and building capacity to implement social, racial, and environmental justice. Uh, you know, the, the foundation and philanthropic community can work in a way uh, that can be more nimble at the community scale than, than government. And so it can be a, a strong partner for government efforts. And uh, although, you know, I'm not expecting that the financing foundation community has funding on the scale to build large infrastructure projects, they have an appropriate uh, partnership area to, you know, help with community planning, um, help get the, the ball rolling towards larger projects with, again, with planning efforts, with initial design, and, uh, and that will be, uh, could be of great help. So with that, here's my, uh, my contact information. I encourage you to, uh, 
to go to the Governor's Council on Climate Change website, the DEP, where you can find all these reports and information and uh, join us as we convene our subcommittee meetings on December 4th and December 7th. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. That was terrific. And, and thank you for your leadership of the, uh, the How Can We Pay For It Committee, which I think now should be the only way we refer to it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lively and complicated group. Uh, if I could ask um, Professor Brown and Sarah, if you could come back to, to the stage as we're all, and Rebecca, if you could actually turn your camera back on so you could stay. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Don't go. <laughs> no, Sarah, you come back on too. You guys are killing me. <laughs> Great. Good. We're all kind of learning the, uh, I, I like the, uh, for those of you who are, who are watching this, uh, we see each other in a, in a Zoom box and then it's broadcast out. So we're literally on stage and off stage is how they, uh, they refer to it. So I thought we could start with a few questions that I had um, and then I won't hog all the time. I'll, we can then turn it to, I'll ask Luann to come on and she's been monitoring the, the question uh, form. So for those of you who have questions for, uh, for, for Professor Bronin or Dr. French, if you would kindly use the link on the, uh, on the webpage to submit your question. We'll be triaging them and trying to come up with exemplars. It seemed like it, what's most on everyone's mind. But I wanted to start and try and tie in uh, uh, Barry Hill's keynote speech. Uh, Barry uh, made, a, a, I think, a pretty uh, clear and, and forceful rights-based question for how do we get expanded attention at all levels of decision-making on environmental justice and equity. And he was pretty clear to talk about some some past legislation at the federal level that's decades old and thought that the charge really led to the states. So why don't we start there? If you, if you had to triage the, the top issues from your different perspectives that you think would make the most difference either at the state or municipal level in either legislation or decision-making or policies, what are the things you think that would make us the most equitable, make our resilience the fairest? Um, sort of off the bat. So I, uh, Sarah, why don't we start with you and then we'll go to uh, Rebecca. I mean, that's a really big question because there's obviously, you know, resiliency issues that I've, I've looked at that, um, that go beyond, uh, you know, just the housing issue. Um, I mean, just if sticking with the housing issue, I think probably the the uh, a a very important thing that we would need should do is to um, get our hands around uh, the link between transportation and uh, and development and housing in particular. Um, I think you know probably despite you know all you know my interest in in land use law, um, I probably think the biggest thing that we can do from a resiliency perspective is get people out of their cars. Um, Connecticut is a very small state. We have some existing infrastructure. Um, if I were, I could wave a magic wand, I would uh, have an, an interconnected multimodal transportation system that connected uh, towns, including towns that may uh, have had infrastructure like trolleys and things before and just don't now, um, uh, in a, it connect those towns in a way that would encourage people from lots of different backgrounds and walks of life to use transportation. What we see in Hartford, um, which is a, as most people on the call know, probably a, a low income city, um, is that 30 something percent of our households have no access to cars. Um, so their opportunities are constrained by our transportation. At the same time, our transportation system funnels billions of dollars into car infrastructure and biking, walking uh, and bus uh, infrastructure gets, gets pennies. Um, and I, I really think that, you know, despite my, you know, my primary interest and expertise is in land use, but the main thing that we probably need to do is fix the transportation system, because again, we know what to do to fix that issue. We're just not doing it because the, the way decisions are made uh, is not, uh, not, not the best. So it's, it's, a, it's a state of mind thing. So that's what I would fix. Thanks. Uh, I left, sorry, I left myself on mute. <laughs> I was going to say that's the, the perfect thing to think about as because one of the things we talk about within Circa and Rebecca, I know uh, John Trzynski talked about Alex Felsen's uh, retreat corridors. Um, some of the questions are retreat to where, draw development to where. And 
tran transit-oriented development hubs are the natural source. So this goes right also to financing. One thing is policy, another thing are incentives. How do you think the, uh, what are the top things that have sort of come to your mind in, in all the work that you're looking at that would help? Well, uh, we, in the financing group, as you know, uh, we went through each of our recommendations and thought about an equity impact. And I mean, it was a first pass. It was thinking at a, at a high level scale. Um, and there's been some, you know, research into this, uh, but I would say there's a there's room for a lot more investigation into equitable resilience financing for any uh, burgeoning masters and doctoral students out there who are looking for thesis topics. Uh, but uh, you know, it's it's clear that you you could set up a financing program that's regressive or progressive. Uh, so you can you can build uh, into any financing mechanisms ways to account for um, limited abilities to pay. Um, you know what we don't want is uh, what in some ways is already built into the the government's uh, federal government's requirement for benefit cost analyses for projects that inherently areas that have higher land value and this goes to uh, to Sarah's comments about. Um, about the high cost of property properties in Connecticut, that those high high income areas with high property values also tend to do really well on benefit cost analyses. So you don't want to you, you can easily get yourself into an inequitable situation just by the fact that it it's always going to show up that the a, pro, a, a resilience project protecting a high income community is going to do a lot better on a BCA than one protecting a low income community. But we know that vulnerable communities and including the low income communities um, bounce back, uh, don't bounce back as quickly, um, have worse and more sustained impacts after natural disasters is exacerbated by climate change. We've seen that with COVID too. So we really need to build those um, inequities into you know, make sure that we have ways to correct for that in our, in our benefit cost analyses and the way that we might set up um, any financing programs. Great. Um, I, I'd like to ask a, a pet issue question. Um, for both of your your proposal approaches from different, different to your presentations, which approach the problem from different angles, one of the things that's uh, very much on my mind is constancy of purpose. You know, how do we ensure None of these are things we fix next year, right? Sarah ended her talk with on the uh, on the on the on the transit-oriented development. Um, you know, or how do we go through? These are long-term solutions. Um, yet we do have a state that periodically has taken funds that are put aside for one purpose. Um, maybe renewable energy comes to mind and are redeployed for budget holes. Um, towns can do this for open space funds. There is a tendency to take funds once it gets built up. Um, it can be used for other purposes and financial emergencies happen in our state a lot recently. So what would you think would help to ensure that we can continue on what is a long-term policy track for these problems to make sure that both us and then the people who are doing it in the next generation, the generation after that are focused the same way and for voters to support something, they need to know that it can continue. The funds will go where they said it would. So, um, Rebecca, why don't you, you 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 start with this one, and then we'll go to Sarah. Well, I know that I, I'm I'm interested too in what you think about this joke, and <laughs> giving us a thought to it. But, you know, I so often I hear people say, "Well, we need a lockbox. We need a lockbox," and uh, you know, lockboxes are hard to come by. I I think I, I've been giving this quite a bit of thought lately, uh, and. I think part of this solution is to explain to people what what the impacts are and how they're benefiting. You have to get out in front of the issues so that, you know, if people don't understand the benefits of those funds, then they're inherently vulnerable to to maneuvers at the political scale. Everybody's looking for funding. And I think this is a, a challenge for us with climate change in a good way, in part because Connecticut doesn't hit, get hit by as many natural disasters as I was on a call with some of my counterparts in North Carolina, and they were talking about how 
you know, they get a major hurricane once every two years. So, you know, people don't forget, uh, you know, how bad it was. Um, whereas in Connecticut, thankfully, we don't get as hit with as high a frequency of big storms. We will, f we will feel the, the effects of sea level rise. We will feel those in, uh, effects of flooding. Um, but those kind of big wallops, uh, you know, change our, our consciousness. And so you really have to work hard to remind people, uh, you know, how bad it can be and that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't happen frequently, but when he does, when it does, it's a, it's a real serious problem. So, um, Isaias was one of those reminders for us in Connecticut in August that, that we are impacted by storms here. I thought about that each day I was without power across that week. Um, Sarah, what do you think? I mean, I'll echo what Rebecca said. And, you know, I mean, in terms of how do we, how do we keep financing these projects? Well, I know that this week, Jeff Bezos of Amazon has given away hundreds of millions of dollars to environmental organizations all over the country, considering that he's made X tens of billions of dollars uh, off of all of us from the pan during the pandemic. Let's call him up and see what he can uh, what he can fund. Um, I mean, in all seriousness, uh, you know, the, 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 the kinds of uh, funding that sustains itself um, and uh, it can only really be possible with a change in public mindset. And, you know, as you point out your, your own experience of the power outages, you know that that's connected to um, resiliency issues, the, the state of our grid, um, you know, the, the environmental impacts of, of, you know, even sea level rise when it, when, you know, that, that becomes an issue and, and causes outages. Um, we need to help other people in the public connect that. And I think that's where researchers um, come in at UConn and other places um, and where we have to just keep putting studies and, and information uh, and making those links for people. And that's, you know, just tying it back to, to desegregate Connecticut. We know, you know, that the people who study land use know that there are these impacts, land use laws lead to segregation, but the public doesn't make those links necessarily. So a lot of what we're doing is education about helping people, even people in um, in positions like planning and zoning commissions to make those links and to make sure that they're aware that, that, that there are links. And so I think just greater public awareness and education needs to be a central focus uh, in order to get the funding outcomes that we want. That's, that's perfect. Um, so I'm going to ask the last of my questions, and I'm going to ask Luann uh, Cooley to, to kindly come on. She's been watching the audience stream. Um, so the last question I had was it struck me that that both of you uh, made reference to, to state the state and town dichotomy. It's no longer a great insight that Connecticut has uh, many planning issues because of our lack of county or regional structure that has uh, that has direct oversight or teeth. To what extent do you, is that hampering or do you think that's not an issue for the things that are most important to you? And why don't we start with Sarah then go to Rebecca and then Luann, if you can take over. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think structural, uh, you know, the, the structural framework of um, many of our laws is, is probably, um, is probably flawed. I mean, I don't think from a land use perspective, we would if creating the system of land use law that we have, uh, that if, if we wanted to regulate land use, I don't think we would, say now that it's a logical thing to do to have each town uh, have their their own land use laws. You know, one of the things that we've been struggling with at Desegregate Connecticut is do we say, you know, we, we should really push for regional land use authorities, which is what some experts have suggested. Um, you know, our approach, at least at this point, is to say, let's work with the current framework and try to try to fix things by, by having statewide guidance for a few uh, specific topic areas. I think the same is true in the environmental context. I don't think if we were designing the system from scratch, we would have local inland wetland commissions deciding on technical uh, cases, and nor would we probably have uh, local flood control districts. Um, many of these matters are actually uh, uh, policy questions um, and uh, technical questions, but we're, we leave a lot of it to individuals who are largely well-meaning but untrained. Um, so, you know, in all aspects of land use and environmental law, when you have that um, that distinction, uh, you know, again, the question of, you know, would, would we create this again from scratch? The answer is probably no across the board. And I think the uh, that's come that's come to light also in our financing uh, GC3 is you find a disparity in how towns are able to budget and to manage funds. You know, there's also just a core um, infrastructure and ability to do the administration. 
So Rebecca, what do you think of the same question? To what extent do you look at the GC3, GC3 writ large or our own subcommittee and think about that, that difference of, of, of hyper-local versus state? Well, I I think it it works at both <laughs> it works at both levels. Um, I I do agree with with Sarah's comments that you need to make sure that you get the the technical expertise and and sometimes that resides uh, you know in the state or even more so at the federal level, um, and so you need to be able to work across. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's something we spent a lot of time talking about in the financing group was that that strategy one, which is really about um, increasing Connecticut's competitiveness for um, for federal dollars, and that is about capacity building. And often, it's the municipalities who are applying for grants through the state of Connecticut. That's how our our Department of Emergency Management, Homeland Security. Um, now called Building Resilient Infrastructures and Communities Grants through FEMA, which has $500 million this year, you know, 25 times what they had just a couple of years ago for resilience projects, which is incredible. Um, but the way we've set that up is the municipalities have to come up with the projects and then we kind of met them at the state and we put them forward as a one state application. And we're working through how can we improve our state application, which is really the collective application of multiple municipalities and uh, and so it's it's going to have to be a strong partnership uh, across the, both entities. And thanks for delivering like one piece of really uplifting news with, yeah. the, with the expanded FEMA grant. You know, sometimes at conferences like that, we're usually hunting for a little good news. Like, thanks, um, Luann. Thank you for joining us. Uh, do you have questions that either you could summarize from the audience or issues that have come up? Yeah, sure. We've gotten a couple of questions in from the audience. Um, one that sort of ties into just what uh, Dr. French was saying about um, how these grants are um, tied together with, uh, with the FEMA money. Um, there was a question about how Massachusetts has tied hazard mitigation to climate adaptation and resiliency and asked municipalities to develop local or regional plans addressing both together. Would this be an approach that would be useful in Connecticut in helping to discern common vulnerabilities uh, and develop action strategies? Uh, yes, I, I do think that uh, is an approach. It, it is an approach we have taken to some extent in Connecticut already. So uh, in the aftermath of, of Sandy, our, uh, we had planning funds through the, the Connecticut, administered by the Connecticut Department of Housing, and they funded 35 uh, coastal resilience plans at the municipal scale. Most of those plans were then adopted by those municipalities into their uh, natural hazard mitigation plans, I, which, I th which I think was a wise decision. Uh, we didn't necessarily tell them to do that at the state level, but it makes a lot of sense because uh, the, the hazard mitigation plans has, uh, you know, it, it's tied into statute. We don't have coast, a coastal resilience plan doesn't appear anywhere in statute. It doesn't trigger anything. It doesn't build into, you know, it doesn't connect to a larger state plan at this, at this time. So, uh, so that is, that is an approach that they've taken in Massachusetts. I think there's a lot of validity to it. I will say though, that it's important. We also link uh, these two resilience planning to our plans of conservation and development, because not all issues are hazard mitigation. Sometimes they they are also often about long term land use planning and natural resources, which is much more a part of the plans of conservation development at the municipal and state scale. Thank you, um, Professor Bronin. Would you like to add anything about that in terms of um, uh, how? towns could use their plans of conservation and development um, to add more robust language about resiliency? I mean, uh, sure, I, I, they should all do that. Um, <laughs> plans, however, are not uh, laws. Um, and so I think we've seen that many times in, in lots of different contexts that whatever you've said in the plan does not equal a, a legal um, a mandate or, or guidance or, or whatever. So. Um, yes, they should account for resiliency in their plans. They should account for affordable housing in their plans. Uh, but more importantly, they should, uh, you know, work to change their laws. Uh, by the way, with guidance from Circa and prior legal fellows um, through our Center for Energy and Environmental Law, which have handed towns, you know, templates and documents and analysis of their own uh, codes. Um, and so, you know, we've tried to help bridge that gap. 
And so we encourage any town planners who are on this call to take, especially the shoreline towns, I should say, uh, to take advantage of those documents because that gives you a really good template of not only just how to plan, but also how to incorporate into the local law. And, and we saw in that process some, some willingness. Um, a lot of towns, several that I know of directly, took some of those white papers and, and frankly went down the list and, and made a lot of changes. What else, what else have we got, Luann? Oh, we had a question uh, that was aimed towards Rebecca, um, and the person who asked the question wanted to know, um, did you all help provide input to the Long Island Sound Blue Plan uh, from the lens of the GC3 goals? Uh, at this time, not specifically, although I'm, I'm hesitating a little bit because the Working and Natural Lands Working Group, Wetlands Rivers, definitely had individuals who were participating both of those processes. We didn't have, you know, through the executive order, uh, um, a specific alignment, but uh, there may be overlapping recommendations that can accomplish goals in both areas. And so I appreciate the comment for, you know, for flagging that. And that's one of the things that we're gonna take a closer look at in that phase two processes where the, the governor charged us with taking the recommendations and strategies and putting them into agency planning processes, which would include the blue plan. Great. Okay, and I have one last question, uh, and this is about funding uh, infrastructure issues. Um, Rhode Island has developed an infrastructure bank uh, that is a model that could be used perhaps in Connecticut uh, for financing some of these multi-jurisdictional or regional resilience infrastructure projects, things like um, tide gates, dam dams, et cetera. Um, do you think that's something that would work in Connecticut? So great, I, this, is, this is an idea that is in our uh, adaptation and resiliency and financing recommendation. We have something called the Environmental Infrastructure Bank uh, a, uh, that, that looks a lot like what they're doing in Rhode Island. Uh, the, uh, the Environmental Infrastructure Bank, I think there was policy proposed in previous years along similar lines. Uh, the idea is that uh, you want you want to open up more opportunities for capital investment and resilience. And one of the ways to do that is to use, is to use loans. And uh, we don't have a, a loan program. Largely we're funding these programs through federal grants, state bond funds, um, funding grants to towns. So, uh, so yeah, so, so making more way, the idea is to, you know, create more ways to get capital flowing to this important issue. Great. Thank you very much. And I'll turn that back to you, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I have one last question, which is the, do you think either of your efforts would be enhanced if the state, sort of like uh, what, what Barry Hill had talked about in other states, um, had, if there was a fundamental as in a constitutional right within the state constitution toward some part of climate resilience or environmental ethic? Would that help, or do you think that's actually really to the side of what you're trying to do? Would constitutionalizing part of this assist, or meh? This is probably not the most sophisticated way to ask the question, but what do you think? Do we need more to, to, uh, to put something in? Actually, I mean, on the housing front, Connecticut has at least some laws of the constitutional type nature, and in, in, they're, they're, they're in statutes, but that require towns to provide for affordability, you know, for example. The issue is, I think, not so much that language on the housing side, but the uh, the, the mechanisms by which that has been enforced and the clarity with which local governments who are regulating land use understand their obligations. On the environmental side, more broadly, you know, I know that, you know, we brought to Yukon our uh, uh, speaker who uh, discussed a, a green uh, amendment to the constitution which would give uh, people a, a right to clean air and water and do some other things too. Um, you know, that I think is, uh, you know, uh, I, I actually think that's a good idea. I think it's worth exploring. Connecticut really values um, all of those things. Um, you know, we, we value it, but we don't actually regulate and legislate for it. Um, so you know, that may help bring to the fore, um, you know, better ways to do that, not just whether the constitutional amendment passes, but whether, uh, we're all thinking about that issue uh, from a political perspective and how to achieve it. And I, I've, 
I'm hesitating to address anything that, that's talking about a constitutional amendment since I, I'm not a, I don't have legal training, but from, I, I am a geoscientist and uh, I was definitely struck by, by this, um, by our speaker this morning's talking about air not being part of the public trust. I definitely know from the earth science perspective, what happens when you don't, tr when you treat a resource like it is somehow infinite and that it will never run out and never be impacted no, no matter how much CO2 you pump into it, right? So, and, and whatever else you can't, that, that's, we understand our, our environmental and physical world much better than that. And that should be translated into, into the way we, um, into the into our laws and that the govern us. Perfect. Well, on that basis, um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Bronin and Dr. French for participating today. Luann, I'd like to thank you for uh, for all of your help throughout this conference and uh, for helping us at that point in time. Um, I have just a quick screen share for the closing of of what will be our our conference. Um, the bear with me. Just some next steps. Um, this is from Circa. Each panel is getting the same slides. Um, the uh, next steps, we, Circa will be continuing to refine technical tools and training. So look for announcements from then. They're going to be identifying pilot projects as we move into phase three. Uh, continue engagement activities in the near term. We'll look for workshops uh, from starting in January and through spring of 2021. And feel free to sign up for uh, Circa's newsletter, circa.ucon.edu. The Resilience Roundup is widely read. Um, I know from firsthand experience that it makes a, it has a great penetration. So please grab a look at it uh, if you haven't signed up for it already. Uh, just a reminder that there is a, uh, the Yukon School of Law can offer CLE credit for this. Please email Luann Cooley, L-O-U-A-N-N-E, dot C-O-O-L-E-Y at uconn.edu. And there are 2.7 hours of CM credit through the Connecticut chapter of the American Planning Association. So on that basis, I really wanna thank you all for attending today. Um, these conferences and the work through Focus on Resilience makes an awful lot of difference. Professor Bronin referenced some of the work that's come out of conferences like this and efforts like this that have really changed uh, really changed people's lives and changed the, the way that we function within our towns and the way we function within the state, how we approach sea level rise, how we bring science into the environment. So your participation here really matters. On that basis, thank you very much. <laughs>